cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, we've discussed BPC-157 taken in isolation countless times. We talked about TB-500 taken alone and those peptides taken together as a combo, but we've yet to talk about their key differences, and today that's what we're going to focus on. It's also a great time to introduce to you something I've worked quite hard to organize, and that is the Peptide Pages series, a detailed comprehensive guide on one peptide at a time, the first of which is BPC-157. How fitting. I've realized that most written guides that exist out there on the topic of peptides are less informative and more, shall I say, performative, to boast hype and promise. This, on the other hand, is more educational. I've tried my best to synthesize the research available and discuss all we know about BPC-157 from the data on gut health to musculoskeletal injury and that regarding the nervous system. The total thing is 20 pages long and I hope you enjoy it. The link to get your hands on it are in the description below as well as on the main page of my channel. Of course, none of the info provided there is to endorse peptide use or provide medical advice. It's purely informative and educational, I hope. And the details of the contents are, as you'll see, provided in the attached link so you can read up on it if you're interested. Now let's get back to our regularly scheduled programming. We're going to hone in on the biochemical and mechanistic differences between BPC-157 and TB-500, which of course overlap in some regard. They're both part of the popular Wolverine Protocol, which is understandably a bit of an optimistic and facetious title, but where should we start? Now, I was going to put this at the end of the video, but let's put it at the beginning just to get some confusing matters out of the way. When we talk about TB500, the biggest issue in understanding, or one of them, is mislabeling and marketing confusion. Originally, TB500 referred to fragment 17 to 23 of thymosin beta 4, TB4. But many of these gray market peptide vendors don't actually sell the fragment. Instead, they either sell full length thymosin beta 4, or a longer or different fragment and still call it TB500. This makes it difficult to compare research because a lot of so-called TB500 studies may actually be looking at full TB4, or in essence the ones quoted may be, but it's not true to the original TB500 formula. In this video, we're focusing on the true TB500, its original fragment-based design, and what actual research says about it separating fact from the marketing fiction. So just to recap, because I know this can be confusing and it's why I added in these details after the fact, TB500, true TB500, is TB4 fragment 17 through 23 with an acetyl group at the end. So technically speaking, TB500 and this fragment are minutely different. But for the sake of this video and actually evaluating the research on this fragment, we're going to be addressing them the same way. I hope this clarifies things a bit. Well, I think a good place to begin our conversation is at the level of structure, the structural basis of each peptide. Now, BPC-157 is 15 amino acids long, hence its title as a pentadecapeptide, and it was initially isolated from human gastric acid by a research team led by Dr. Predrag Sikorich at the University of Zagreb. On the other hand, TB500 is technically a 7 amino acid fragment of a much more researched, larger compound called TB4. It's more aptly named TB4 fragment, or TB4... 17 to 23 because it's literally amino acids 17 through 23 of TB4, which is in total 43 amino acids long. Now, we know both of these peptides are implicated, theoretically at least, in healing and recovery in preclinical models. And hence, people hope to target wounds, injuries, GI tract problems, and other elements with the peptides in combination or alone. I've suggested different concerns with regards to risks of each of these in isolation or in combo in different videos, so we'll save that rehash until the end. BPC-157, as described in the aforementioned guide, is thought to intermingle with different stages of healing and recovery through interaction with multiple signaling pathways, which are in a way noted but not fully elucidated. But some of the prominent theories about how BPC-157 operates is through increasing expression of vascular endothelial growth factor, better known as VEGF, which would in part be responsible for its angiogenic properties. 
formation of new blood vessels, and collateral blood flow to injured sites. VEGF overexpression is not universal and depends on dosage, administration, and tissue type. Moreover, one study highlighted that perhaps there is increased growth hormone receptor expression as seen in a culture of rodent tendon fibroblasts involving the JAK2 signaling pathway. We talked about this recently in the BPC-157 and growth hormone video. And other preclinical data hints that BPC-157 may activate components of the fac pexillin pathway, which could be responsible for cellular migration, proliferation, as well as cellular survival. Other things thought to be at play here include antioxidant properties and some sort of unclear role in neurotransmitter modulation, potentially one day having a more explored utility in the context of things like mood and cognition, but something that is generally underexplored at this point or, like everything else, isolated to preclinical models. TB500, on the other hand, as we commented on earlier, is much less explored than its progenitor compound TB4. TB4 is a prevalent endogenous compound known as a beta-thymosin that's known for its affinity for binding actin, thereby promoting components of cellular migration, differentiation, of stem and progenitor cells, and like BPC-157, formation of new blood vessels. Due to its anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and pro-recovery effects, TB4 has been proposed for clinical management of cardiovascular conditions, ocular injuries, gastrointestinal conditions, skin wounds, and hair growth, among other topics of interest. And as such, fragments of TB4, which have different proposed biochemical functions, have been evaluated in different preclinical and clinical contexts. Now, there are are some overarching themes in preclinical models, one of which appears to be suppression of NF-kappa-B, also known as nuclear factor, kappa light chain enhancer of activated B cells, so we'll stick with the abbreviation, but it's a transcription factor whose downstream effects mediate properties of inflammation. Additionally, you'll see different articles exploring TB4's inhibition of different caspases, which comprise a family of proteases or these enzymes that are involved in apoptosis. Therefore, inhibition of different enzymes within this class has labeled TB4 and TB500 the title of anti-apoptotic which essentially means against or preventative towards programmed cell death, so pro-survival. More on this later. And like BPC-157, TB4 appears to be upregulating towards expression of VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, which would correlate with increased formation of new blood vasculature. TB4 itself does have some clinical trials in human volunteers, which are interesting and involve different types of ulcers, heart conditions, and dry eye, which appear generally safe and positive, so I encourage you to look into them if so interested. If you'd like, we can do a video on these trials alone, but it's worth honing in to our compound of interest. So if you want to evaluate the data on use of TB500 in particular, we've got to make sure we're looking at the correct fragment, 17 to 23 in particular, which has predominantly been in the context of the heart, the brain, and even the hair. This fragment is thought to most strongly increase angiogenesis and play a role in hair growth. However, is this accurate? Is it legitimate? I'm not quite sure because with regards to hair growth, one preclinical study in mice that showed increased hair growth is the reference cited to support this claim. However, it doesn't appear the researchers used the TB500 fragment and instead trialed full-length TB4, so I'm unsure why this conclusion was drawn. Moreover, when you follow the adjacent source and others included, you're redirected to these articles either about TB4 in its entirety and in one case even an article that doesn't mention fragment 1723 or even any thymus and peptides. Point being, the reliability of the findings listed are certainly in question, so let's redirect a bit and search through references based on the peptide's amino acid formula. LKKTETQ. And lo and behold, we're drawn to one article in particular that evaluates TB500's use in dermal wound repair in diabetic mice. Now, since this fragment is thought to possess the actin binding domain of TB4, it's thought to, in a way, mimic the effects of the whole 43 amino acid peptide TB4. In this particular study, it appeared to promote increased collagen deposition in diabetic mice and keratinocyte migration of aged mice, thereby hinting at at reparative effects towards wound recovery. The fragment has also been seen to induce mast cell exocytosis, which essentially may implicate it in release of inflammatory mediators. The precise relevance of this is unclear, but it highlights that in some way or another, TB500 could theoretically modulate processes of inflammation or in some way interact with the process as a whole. 
Moreover, one study of human hepatic stellate liver cells indicates the fragment may be responsible for the antifibrogenic effects of TB4 in some way or another affecting scar formation. Now, the past few minutes, as convoluted as they were, synthesized the body of research on the effects of TB4 fragments 17 to 23 in particular, TB500. Research is entirely preclinical, diverse, and sparse. As in the results of anything emphasize TB500 as the actin-binding domain of the TB4 compound. However, the relevance of this in isolation or in combo with another peptide is essentially non-existent, and anybody who tells you that it will definitely work X way or you'll achieve Y result is is either the most brilliant person in the world or inaccurate. And it's difficult to state for certain that the fragment is representative of the effects of TB4 when research hasn't portrayed how or why it would be. Additionally, if we're assuming I worry about the purported angiogenic and anti-apoptotic properties of TB4, although some contexts seem promising in order for cancer to spread, it typically feeds off these two properties, increased blood flow and signals that say don't kill these cells become relevant when thinking about budding growths or tumors or cancerous spread. Just some concerns of mine I feel I should state. And honestly, the same concern goes for BPC-157 as one of the leading theories about how it operates is via increased expression of vascular endothelial growth factor, which is responsible for a lot of these angiogenic properties. And one thing worth adding is that although multiple articles claim the fragment of TB500 is linked with increased blood flow and hair growth, I cannot find where these comments are sourced from because I've looked at the references they're supposedly linked to, but it's a finding that's not transparent and in my opinion limited. It's something that repeated and sourced, but the sources don't add up with the conclusion, in my opinion. I know this ended up being more of a deep dive on TB500 than on BPC-157. I feel we've covered the different research evaluating BPC-157 in the past, so you deserve the real deets on TB4 fragments 17 through 23. I will add, as we've discussed before, there's been one human trial that included both BPC-157 and TB4, the entire compound. I do think there are big confounders at play, but nonetheless, it's a good starting point it's a fair starting point. It was low sample size and included a patient population of individuals that administered either BPC-157 alone or alongside TB4. No objective tools were utilized to clarify improvements and subjects were contacted via phone call and asked about status of pain. Most of these included experienced some relief of their knee pain. However, as we stated in the video we made on the topic, reliability of the results is limited due to the retroactivity of this study, sample size, as well as methods by which pain severity were measured. Point being, although research on both peptides is interesting, it's vastly preclinical, and there's unclear translation to humans. That said, I think this is enough for today. If you did like this video, please hit that like and subscribe button, give the Patreon a peruse, and subscribe if you're looking for a way to further support the channel. But most importantly, I hope you have a great day. You take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull up a chair, let's get this straight, peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.